Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Kim Brown in Baltimore. It's official. The Earth has entered the Anthropocene Epoch. That's a new geological era defined by human impact. This according to an expert group of scientists assembled at the International Geological Congress in Cape Town, South Africa this week. July 2016 was the warmest July in 136 years of modern record keeping, according to a monthly analysis of global temperatures by the scientists at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. This week in an interview with The Guardian newspaper, Gavin Schmidt, who's the director of the Institute, said, quote, it's unprecedented in a thousand years. There's no period that has the trend seen in the 20th century in terms of the inclination of temperatures, end quote. While droughts and wildfires and floods rage all around the world, including across the U.S., Hawaii's Big Island just dodged a bullet with Hurricane Madeline as it weakened to a tropical storm as it passed uh, through, although forecasters warn that Hurricane Lester is not far behind. Hurricane Hermine made landfall in Florida early Friday, bringing with it torrential rains and strong winds, knocking out power to over 200,000 residents and possibly causing the death of at least one person. Hermine has been downgraded to a tropical storm and will move its way up the East Coast over the weekend. It was the first time in recorded history that three tropical storm systems threaten the U.S. simultaneously. If Lester makes landfall on the Big Island as a hurricane, it would be the first since record keeping began. Now with us to discuss extreme weather and the link to climate change is Dr. Michael E. Mann. Michael is the Distinguished Professor and Director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. He's also author of the new book titled Madhouse Effect. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks. It's good to be with you. Michael, we had you on just recently to discuss the flooding in Louisiana, and now we have these hurricanes and tropical storms causing more damage and potentially an unprecedented hurricane in terms of historical records that may hit Hawaii. Can you talk about this in relation to climate change and if this could be seen as part of a pattern? Yeah, so one of the things that we know is that climate change is warming up the oceans and all other things being equal, uh, warmer oceans means more evaporation of that very warm water into the atmosphere, more moisture, and it's the moisture and the lifting of that moisture that is what powers a hurricane, a tropical storm. And so as we warm up the earth, as we warm up the ocean surface, we provide more energy to strengthen uh, to create and strengthen these storms, tropical cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, um, uh, different manifestations of the same thing, a tropical storm. So uh, whether or not we will see more hurricanes or fewer hurricanes is still up for debate uh, because that depends on a variety of factors. But the things that we're pretty confident about are that we will see more intense hurricanes and that those hurricanes will yield more of those, uh, those soak, uh, soaking rains that we're seeing right now, for example, with Hermione. A uh, warmer atmosphere, more moisture in the air means the potential for more rainfall. And so we expect to see heavier flooding associated with these tropical storms, the sort of flooding that we're seeing right now with Hermione. Uh, so the bottom line is more intense and damaging hurricanes and more damage from uh, flooding associated with even larger amounts of rainfall. Uh, it isn't coincidental that over the last year we have seen the strongest hurricane or typhoon on record in both the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. We are seeing climate change impacting these storms in terms of their intensity and in terms of the flooding damage that they're doing. Your associate, Gavin Schmidt, who is the lead scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, he said this week in an interview uh, with The Guardian that, again, it's unprecedented in a thousand years what we've been seeing in terms of temperatures. But he also went on to say that maintaining temperatures below the one and a half degree guardrail requires significant and very rapid cuts in carbon dioxide emissions. And that is very unlikely to be a thing, that we are not even making emissions cuts commiserate with keeping warm warming below the two degree mark. Do you agree with those statements? Uh, the first part of it is correct. In fact, his statement that the warming that we're seeing is unprecedented in at least a thousand years, ironically, that conclusion is based on the so-called hockey stick uh, curve. 
that my co-authors and I published back in the late 1990s. And uh, we demonstrated with that publication that the warming that we've seen uh, over the last few decades is outside the range of anything we see for at least the past thousand years. So that conclusion actually dates back uh, a decade and a half now. And it provides context for understanding the onslaught of record-breaking years we're seeing. Uh, 2014 was the warmest year on record, but then it was beat out by 2015, and now 2016 looks poised to beat out 2015. That would be three record-breaking years in a row. And that warmth has this larger context where we haven't seen anything like that in at least a 1,000 years. Now, in terms of keeping warming below uh, certain thresholds, uh, the threshold that's most widely uh, discussed is the two degrees Celsius, three and a half degree Fahrenheit threshold. Uh, that is the level of warming where we uh, anticipate the worst impacts of climate change and, and the, the greatest potential for irreversible climate change impacts. Some regions, low-lying island nations, uh, rightly point out that with even less warming, uh, they are likely to uh, be destroyed. Um, uh, we will see the disappearance of low-lying island nations because of the sea level rise associated with even less warming. And uh, that's where the one and a half degrees Celsius target comes in. Uh, many of the representatives from these low-lying uh, island nations and elsewhere have articulated the case for not a two degree Celsius warming limit, but an even lower one and a half degrees Celsius warming limit. Now, that indeed will be a challenge. Uh, in order to avoid that amount of warming, uh, we do have to rapidly ramp down our carbon emissions in the years ahead. Where I disagree with my good friend Gavin Schmidt is that uh, it is wrong to conclude that that's uh, impossible. Uh, that's really an assessment of willpower rather than of science. Um, the science tells us that we can still avoid crossing that threshold. It will require uh, a major uh, effort on our part. But if you look at what's going on right now, there are reasons for cautious optimism. We actually saw carbon emissions come to a peak two years ago and slightly decline for the first time in decades last year. Uh, that suggests that the efforts that are already afoot to transition away from burning of fossil fuels towards renewable energy, that um, those efforts uh, among you know, the various nations of the world are paying dividends. We are already seeing that effort in the numbers that are coming in. Those numbers are telling us we're starting to turn the corner. We need to turn the corner even faster. And there was a historic agreement reached uh, earlier this year in Paris, actually last year, uh, December uh, 2015 in Paris, um, where nearly 200 nations from around the world, including the world's largest emitters, us, China, um, and, and many of the other major emitters, uh, all agreed to lower their carbon emissions in the decades ahead by an amount that will actually get us halfway to where we need to be. So it won't solve the problem, but it actually, if, if those uh, nations make good on their commitments, it'll get us halfway from where we would otherwise be, business as usual, warming of four to five degrees Celsius, seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit warming of the planet by the end of the century. It'll get us halfway down to where we need to be, less than two degrees Celsius, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. What that says is that we're making real progress we have to try even harder. We have to turn the corner even faster. And that's what uh, many of us hope we will see in the years ahead. Uh, we'll see even uh, more stringent commitments from the nations of the world as we seek to combat this you know, threat, this existential unprecedented threat. Michael, we hear a lot about reducing carbon emissions. What one thing we hear less about but starting to hear more about is that of methane gas emissions because um, as you know that the United States, Canada and other nations around the world participate in the energy extraction um, as no, known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking in order to um, extract gas and crude oil out of um, shale. And the process is known to release uh, tremendous amounts of methane gas. How does the methane figure into what we're trying to do in terms of reduce emission on the carbon side? But are we maybe uh, not even 
are we are we canceling those those gains out by engaging with this methane release? Yeah, so that's a real concern. Um, you know, natural gas is arguably a less carbon intensive source of fuel than uh, than coal, for example. And so there are those who have argued that if we can get off coal at least and um, and replace uh, that in part with uh, the burning of natural gas, that that could help us uh, get on that pathway that we need to get on to lower our carbon emissions. Uh, one of the problems there is what you note. Um, uh, some of that natural gas, which is mostly methane, actually escapes into the atmosphere during the process of uh, natural gas extraction, during fracking, uh, hydraulic fracturing. And uh, methane is actually a very potent greenhouse gas, even more potent than CO2. So if enough of that methane escapes into the atmosphere, uh, it could easily offset any nominal advantage that natural gas might seem to have over coal when you look at the CO2 uh, emissions associated with the two sources. So what it really underscores is the fact that we have to get off fossil fuels um, uh, full stop. Um, and natural gas is a fossil fuel just like petroleum, oil, just like coal. If we are to, again, stabilize the climate below those dangerous levels of warming, uh, we really have to get off fossil fuels uh, entirely. Um, and that means uh, leaving most of the natural gas, most of the oil, and just about all of the coal in the ground. We can't continue to extract and burn those fossil fuels if we are going to keep warming below that dangerous threshold. So some climate deniers are still saying that this warming trend is part of a natural pattern. How do we know that it isn't? Yeah, we, we, there's so many different ways we know that, uh, that it can't be natural, that we could spend a whole hour talking about it. Um, but the simplest point uh, to make here is that we are seeing warming now, a rate of warming that, as we discussed earlier, is unprecedented. Uh, potentially in thousands of years. And we know that when we take climate models and we drive them just with the natural factors, guess what? The climate models actually want to cool over the last half century. Natural factors like volcanoes and a decrease in, in solar output have actually been pushing the climate in the opposite direction. So not only can't they explain the warming we've seen, they haven't even been pushing us in that direction. We have offset any small natural cooling that might have arisen from those natural factors. And all of the warming that we've seen is due to human impact. G20 leaders are meeting in China this week and three of the world's biggest multinational insurers, Aviva, Asian, and Amlin, uh, they're calling on them to implement a time frame to end the subsidies for fossil fuel companies. Do you think we've entered an era where the cost is becoming clearer and the risk are outweighing the benefits of a fossil fuel based economy? Yeah, absolutely. Very well put. Um, the bottom line is that there is this damage that is done to our planet, to our economy, to us, to our health, to our food, to water, to ecosystems, everything you can imagine. There's this damage that is being done by the burning of fossil fuels and the climate change it's causing and the acidification of the oceans that it's causing. And the problem has been that uh, up to now, there has been no market signal that reflects that damage. Um, nobody pays for that pollution. You can pollute our atmosphere for free and, and do all the damage that comes with it. That has to change. We need to put a price on the emission of carbon so that we do indeed level the playing field so that renewable energy can fairly compete against fossil fuel energy. And so not only should we not be providing incentives in the form of subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, we need to be providing disincentives. We need to put a price on the burning of carbon and we need to incentivize clean energy so that we can, as I said earlier, turn the corner towards a fossil fuel free economy even faster, fast enough to avoid truly catastrophic changes in our climate. And lastly, Michael, I mean, realistically, what is the time frame for that? Do you think that enough of the, the Earth's countries, especially the biggest polluters, do you think we can all get on the same page? I mean, the Paris Accords notwithstanding, you know, it's one thing to sign something. It's a whole another thing to actually put it into practice. I mean, are we 20 years away from this? 50, 100? Do, can we get some sort of um, 
outlier here? Like, what, what do you, how far away do you think we are from this? Yeah, I'm actually pretty optimistic about this, and I'll tell you why. Um, the largest emitter of carbon on the planet right now is China. It's no longer the United States. And uh, China and the U.S. reached this bi bilateral agreement a, a year ago to lower their carbon emissions. And then they both were signatories, of course, to the Paris Accord. Um, here's the thing. China is actually decommissioning coal-fired power plants now. They are investing far more on wind and solar energy than anybody else in the world. And so here we have the world's largest emitter having recognized we've got to stop this way of doing business. And, and China now is moving dramatically in the direction of renewable energy to the extent that they've flooded the global marketplace with cheap uh, solar uh, panel technology, and that's making it much easier for other countries to build their uh, renewable energy uh, economy. So we're seeing immense progress being made. We're seeing the world's largest emitter actually move dramatically away from the burning of fossil fuels. Now, obviously, we here in the U.S. have to keep um, uh, up our end of the deal, um, the commitment that we have made to China and to the rest of the world in Paris. And what we obviously will need is a president uh, who will continue the policies of the current administration and uh, continue to uh, work to address the issue of climate change rather than deny that the problem even exists. We face a very stark choice in this next election between a candidate, the Democratic candidate, who will continue the policies of the current administration and help and, and make sure that the U.S. helps lead in the effort to, uh, to, to, to migrate away from a, a fossil fuel economy versus uh, the Republican candidate, Donald Trump, who dismisses climate change as a hoax. Um, the stakes couldn't be greater in this next election. We've been joined with Michael E. Mann. He is a doctor. Michael is the distinguished professor at and the director of the Earth System and Science Center at Penn State University. He's also author of the new book, The Madhouse Effect. Michael, I know The Madhouse Effect has some wonderful illustrations. Can you shout out your, your co-illustrator of the book? Uh, absolutely. Tom Tolles is the uh, Washington Post's editorial cartoonist. Many of your viewers will be familiar with his square cartoons that appear in the Washington Post and all over the place every day. And there's always that little guy down in the corner and you have to read what he's saying. Uh, that little guy is actually Tom himself, drawing himself. And he always has some very clever commentary. Well, Tom has probably done the hardest hitting editorial commentary about climate change in our entire media over the last decade in the form of his hard-hitting cartoons in the Washington Post. And it was a real honor to be able to work with him to, to use that to, 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 to write a book that tries to approach this problem from a different direction, that uses satire um, and, and ridicule and the exposing hypocrisy, uh, but a lot of humor. Um, in talking about the issue uh, of climate change and what we need to do to uh, combat this problem, to prevail in combating this problem. The Madhouse Effect, it is in bookstores. You should go pick it up. Dr. Mann, we certainly appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.